This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, we have a round table. It's square <laughs> or rectangular with four people in it. Besides myself, there's Sean Powers, Jonathan Bennett, and Simon Phipps, Webmink himself. And we talk about so many things. It's impossible to summarize them all, but they're all good. They're all current. They all matter. And they're all coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 751, recorded Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. The FIPS certification. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV, now called ACI Learning. ACI's new cyber skills is training that's for everyone, not just the pros. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners can receive up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution plan after completing their form. Based on your team's size, you'll receive a properly quoted discount tailored to your needs. And by Bitwarden, get the open source password manager that can help you stay safe online. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise Plan trial, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. This is Floss Weekly. I am Doc Searles. And this week, because our scheduled guest came down with COVID, um, we have to move him elsewhere. We have brought in a team which includes this time we have a square table, not a round table, a rectangular table with yes. <laughs> with the bat signal Bennett. went up, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> bat signal went up, and uh, and Sean Powers and Simon Phipps. Uh, I'm here for Sean. diversity purposes because I'm in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> we're in we're in four. Actually, two of us are in the Eastern Time Zone. One in the Central, and one in uh, in uh, some, it's GMT, some, it's GMT some European nonsense. One. Some, yeah, GMT it's almost nighttime here. Yeah, it's uh, we are a very diverse group of day, white so. men. We are so, so diverse, are. you know. <laughs> we, haven't, yes. we haven't even all got beards. Well, I, there's I, 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 I'm here to represent bald people, <laughs> so <laughs> and another bald one has rung the, the bell. Um. <laughs> anyway, so. So let's, uh, we'll start, we're here to talk about news and stuff that matters um, as best we can. And uh, we'll start with Simon, because Simon jumped in with uh, something I think is pretty important. So go with it, Simon. Uh, well, th- one of the heroes of um, the uh, open culture movement is a guy called Carl Malamud, who lives over in California. Carl runs a, an organization called Public Resource. And he's driven by the belief that uh, citizens should be able to see the law that governs their lives. And he believes that that's a fundamental principle of pretty much every uh, democratic system in the world. Carl is putting his, um, his own safety and his money where his mouth is. And what he does is he, he buys copies of the printed law and he scans them and he publishes them on the public resource website. And the result of that is he is routinely sued by uh, the uh, legal authorities of states all over the United States of America and countries all over the world. Uh, At any given moment, Carl is likely to be uh, wound up in a number of lawsuits. Uh, And he's had a, a significant victory recently. He's now teamed up with Electronic Frontier Foundation and he was able to uh, gain a ruling from the American court system that it is fair use to publish a standard which is incorporated into the law of the United States. And that's extremely significant because uh, if you are going to uh, make your own uh, gadget for home, um, it's very important that you're able to go get a copy of the standard for how things are done in your state. Uh, you know, how should you wire your electrics? Uh, what grade of reinforcement do you need in your walls? And all of those things are covered by 
standards that are uh, established by the trade that's involved. But for the longest time, those standards have been behind paywalls. And if you want to actually read the standard that sets the rules for how you do it yourself, how you go fix it, you've had to go spend often significant sums of money buying a standard. Uh, and more relevantly, this sets a precedent in open source, because this means that where uh, a standard for how communications takes place, how security is enforced, and so on, is established in law, um, it's going to be uh, okay for an organization like the Open Source Initiative to publish a copy of that standard, even if the organization that owns it, like ISO, has decided to charge you for a copy. It will be considered fair use for us to do that. So I think this is a very significant win, and I very much want to congratulate Carl uh, for on this win. And undoubtedly, Carl is going to correct me now on Mastodon for something I said slightly wrong in that, <laughs> because he's, he's a very precise gentleman. Uh, what, what do you think of this, guys? Do you, know, do you think this is as well, significant as I do, or am I just an old fogey? I, I want to know whether or not this is like a, what, is this the kind of thing where it's going to be appealed, it's going to go to the Supreme Court, and they're going to do what they've done before and side with the powers that be? Um, I, I think this is a very final ruling that's in here. Really? Uh, I, I, I don't think, let's just have a look at uh, the original case here. Um, I, I believe that it's going to be something that is going to be established as, as law at this point and is not going to be appealed, uh, successfully appealed any further. Um, yeah, it's already, it, the article, it's already it, been appealed. Yeah, it's, it's based on a couple of Supreme Court rulings, it looks like. So uh, it, would, yep. it would be surprising to see this go all the way back to the Supreme Court. Uh, now, if, if the district court had ruled the other way, then sometimes the Supreme Court will send a little nasty gram that says, please consider ruling such and such and such and such that we made when re-deciding this case uh, mm. with a with bit of a, a humorous nudge, nudge, you better straighten up or we're coming after you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, it, this was a, a finding by the Court of Appeal for the DC Circuit. So uh, if there was another circuit where the opposite opinion was found to be the case, it would be possible to appeal to the Supreme Court. But with only uh, the, 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 the way the system works is the appeal courts are uh, uh, the final arbiter, unless a, another appeal court in another state finds differently, and then you can go to the Supreme Court to get them to adjudicate between the two uh, appeals courts. And as as uh, as you said, you know this is all based on a whole load of uh, uh, established law from the Supreme Court. Uh, the other thing that's going on is Carl's got another case just like this in court in Europe, and uh, that could be even more significant because in the in the US system, it tends to be uh, individual trade associations that get incorporated into law, whereas in the European system, it is the European standards organizations that get incorporated into law, and they are part of the ISO system. And um, so I, I think there's a very good chance we're going to see a, a big upset. And uh, in my opinion, it can't come a moment too soon for the uh, very lovely people of the uh, standards environment. <laughs> but it, ISO now, charges, does it not, for its laws? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, they're very limited. Yeah, the ISO it's, charges a ton of money for copies of its of its uh, standards. And ISO is at the moment, um, you know, there's another debacle that's been going on with ISO. Uh, there is a, a a standard called Schematron for doing um, uh, uh, XML schemas. Uh, and the Schematron standard was written by a guy who thought he would do the right thing and make it into an international standard. It was gratefully accepted by ISO. And then when it came time to revise it, ISO decided they were going to put it behind a paywall so that not even the guy who had originally written the standard could read it. Uh, and that has led to a, an activity at ISO that's reviewing whether or not they should be charging for standards when they were contributed from outside the organization and whether or not they should be charging for standards when they're about software. And uh, the, the, the secret uh, information that I have coming through the system suggests that ISO is entirely unsympathetic to giving away things free and uh, does not <laughs> seem moved to uh, make any of these standards open. So that's why this really pleases me, because 
the, this law court finding here is exactly the opposite of what ISO is doing at the moment. And um, I, I, I don't know. I can't, I'm looking forward to it coming under roost. Yeah, now, in most jurisdictions, uh, if I understand correctly, the law itself is going to be public domain. And the, the gray area you get into is where you're talking about where the law references a standard. Or I, I've heard some cases where it's not the law itself. It's like the law with annotations. But in practice, those annotations have almost become part of the, the standard reading of the law. Yeah. And so there's fights well, over whether you can, you know, you can publish the commentary. Does the commentary therefore become the fair use or even public domain? So there, there's, a, there's a little bit of a gray area, but I mean, I think we're all always for putting more information out there for the public to get to. Uh, it's interesting that that, that case um, was actually uh, also fought by public resource. So they, in 2020, um, the, the uh, Supreme Court in the US found that public resource was uh, doing the right thing when it published a copy of the official code of Georgia annotated. Uh, uh, the state of Georgia had been keeping its actual official law under copyright through the mechanism of having an outside publisher publish the annotated version. And that meant that everybody who wanted to see the law in Georgia had to buy a copy of the annotated version. There was no publicly available version. And Carl scanned it and made it available, and the state of Georgia uh, tried to um, sue him for that. So exactly what you just said, uh, you know, we've, we've already been there, and Carl already won that case in the Supreme Court. And this verdict uh, is very much based on the Supreme Court's finding in um, public resource versus uh, the state of Georgia. How how helpful is it going to be in other places like Europe? Obviously, the European courts don't really have any responsibility to even look at U.S. Supreme Court rulings when they make their decision. But I, I know that from time to time, other jurisdictions will sort of take notes and, and see which way the wind is blowing. Do you, do you think a U.S. Supreme Court ruling in this district ruling is, is going to make an impact in Europe? Uh, I think there's already a principle in Europe that the citizen should be able to see the law. Um, uh, I don't think the the uh, what happens in the US is going to set any kind of precedent there, but it is going right. to result in um, Carl being further encouraged to go fight. And as I say, he has a case open in the European courts at the moment. He's actually also fighting cases in the Indian courts on the similar principle. Mm. Uh, he has a, a very soft spot for, for India and has been investing a lot of his self and his time in uh, making the law be open to citizens in India. Uh, and I think he would be up for fighting this anywhere people felt it was a problem. So although it doesn't create a precedent, the individual who won the victory is willing to go fight in, uh, in, in anybody's country. Sounds like he has a, a, a particular uh, <clears throat> strong moral inclination that the law should be available to anyone, which I, I dare say I would I would readily agree with. I think you would probably get on with Carl very well, and it maybe we should be inviting him on the show to tell us about this initiative, even though it's kind of a little bit orthogonal to uh, to open source. Uh, open, it covers on open, open law. I think it makes total sense. So, first, um, I know Jonathan has a question queued up. But first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV, now called ACI Learning. In today's IT talent shortage, whether you operate as your own department or are part of a larger team, your skills must be up to date. 94% of CIOs and CISOs agree that attracting and retaining talent is increasingly critical to their roles. Access more than 7,200 hours of content available. ACI Learning consistently adds new content to keep you at the top of your game. Your team will thank you for entertaining training. ACI Learning's completion rate is 50% higher than their competitors. ACI Learning is excited to introduce Cyber Skills, a solution to future-proof your entire organization, not just the IT department. This new cybersecurity training tool is for all members of your organization, 
It's cybersecurity awareness training for non-IT professionals. With CyberSkills, get flexible on-demand training covering everything from password security and phishing scams to malware prevention and network safety. Your employees will stay motivated and engaged throughout their learning process with easy-to-follow material. With a simple one-hour course overview, your employees gain attack-specific training and knowledge check assessments based on common cyber threats they will encounter on a daily basis. They'll also gain access to bonus courses, documentary-style episodes, so your employees can learn about cyber attacks and breaches in their own style. ACI Learning helps you invest in your team and entrust them to thrive while increasing the entire security of your business. Boost your enterprise cybersecurity confidence today with ACI Learning. Be bold, train smart. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners can receive up to 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan after completing their form. Based on your team size, you'll receive a proper quoted discount tailored to your needs. Okay, so Jonathan, you got a question. I, I do. I actually want to ask Simon about what's up with Alma Linux, what's going on there. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Alma Linux just got FIPS certified, and uh, I, I, I imagine Mr. FIPS might have some thoughts on that. Uh, I know it's such a dad joke, the pun. Um, but uh, what, what's what's I, new? I made what's it at every story? board meeting, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you Why don't you give us a, the the commentary on on the story of Alma Linux and what's new and what you're doing there? I I would love to hear it from your perspective. Yeah. Uh, so so the first thing I have to say is I you know I know nothing about Alma Linux itself as a distro. Uh, so I joined in with the activity there to help them to create an open community. And so uh, I got involved uh, a few years ago now, and we have uh, navigated the course to creating a community uh, controlled uh, organization uh, that has got community managed assets. Uh, it's a 501c6 organization. Um, there are elections coming up for the board. So if anybody is running an Alma Linux mirror or is an Alma Linux committer, they should go uh, become a member now so that they can participate in the, the board elections. And uh, Alma Linux has always been about uh, creating the uh, downstream from RHEL that has proved to be necessary by many organizations. Um, so Alma Linux is, is used now by some uh, very significant end users, uh, people, organizations like CERN, who've got very unique needs for a Linux distro. Uh, and um, Alma Linux has proven very popular amongst uh, organizations with large deployments of Linux that don't need high levels of hands-on support from day to day. Um, it, it, we were uh, slightly disrupted by the decision by Red Hat to um, <laughs> no longer make the full source of RHEL available. And we looked at all the options for continuing to make a bug-for-bug uh, a, a -bug compatible release of RHEL available as Alma Linux. And we came to the conclusion that that was no longer viable, that Red Hat had erected barriers that would mean that anybody who uh, successfully produced a bug-for-bug -bug compatible version would probably be on the end of lawsuits for one reason or another. And I don't want to go into why that would be. Um, we decided as a community organization, we, we, were, we, we couldn't do that. What we have done instead is opted to produce a, an, uh, an ABI compatible release. So the, the uh, Alma Linux release, for all intents and purposes, is unchanged. Uh, there is the potential for there to be a little bit of drift in the functionality, but uh, basically, Alma Linux will continue to be a, uh, a a downstream of RHEL that we construct by using legally publicly available sources. And we've we've talked to the folk at Red Hat, and we've broadly got their support in doing that. Um, they they wouldn't be terribly effusive in public, but they like the way that <laughs> our community uh, works. 
They like the fact that we want to fix bugs in, in CentOS Stream and in RHEL uh, and that we want to make them available uh, off our own back. That they, they like the fact that we form a community that funnels new users into using RHEL. Uh, they like the fact that there is a big overlap between our community and the Fedora community. And so we believe that we've got the grounds for there to be a peaceful relationship over the long term with Red Hat while not compromising on producing uh, an, a, an up-to-date, ABI-compatible, secure, safe version of Linux uh, under the name of Alma Linux. So that's, that's where we are with that. Now, to do the, the, uh, the, the FIPS certification, that was beyond the means of the foundation. And one of our community members has, has gone ahead and, and done that and made it available, made the, the build available to everybody. But yes, so Alma Linux has got that certification courtesy of one of our community members. And that's about everything I can tell you. That's many more things than I even I knew I knew. <laughs> there you go. So I uh, <clears throat> two things two things that come to mind. When we first when when Red Hat first pulled the plug on CentOS and we got Alma Linux and we got Rocky. I said back then that I thought it was interesting that there were two of them because I figured they would take slightly different approaches to things. And so now we've actually seen that borne out. We've got Rocky that is, you know, they are they are committed to continuing to be bug for bug compatible with uh, with RHEL. And you have Alma Linux that has taken a, a little bit of a step back from that. So I find that really interesting that that has indeed happened. And then the other thing I've got to say is there's actually a real advantage to running Alma Linux, and that is you get bug fixes faster. Because RHEL, Red Hat does not like fixing bugs unless they're considered, you know, critical. So one of the ones that comes to mind is ZenBleed. And I, I consider that to be a, a real problem because you could, you could leak information out of VMs. You could leak information into VMs. And it, 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 was, it was pretty bad. It was very trivial to run. And it was a lot of information getting leaked. And at least for the first week or two, Red Hat's approach was... Eh, it's not that big of a deal. We'll get it when we update the kernel the next time. And uh, Alma Linux actually had a, a test patch out within like 48 hours of Zenbleed being announced. And then, you know, another couple of days after that, it went out stable to everybody. And so yep. I, was, I was very impressed with that. And I love the fact that uh, because Alma Linux is making this little bit of a change in how they approach their compatibility, that it's going to mean some bugs get fixed faster. And I think that's a real... Sorry to use a bit of corporate speak here, but that's a real value you add. Like that's that is a really intriguing uh, advantage of running Alma Linux. So I, I pretty much put Alma Linux on my on my new VMs and machines now. I, I think yeah. I think you guys have won me over. Oh, fantastic! Well, we, you know, we did actually upstream that um, that Zenbleed patch. We because we have a, a policy of upstream first if we possibly can, and we only right. uh, we only put out our own patches if we can't upstream the patch. In, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable time. Uh, and so uh, we did actually offer that. And um, uh, there was an interesting discussion. Again, I, 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 you know, I want to stay friends with the people at Red Hat. So I don't want to say anything, anything that uh, would uh, prejudice that. But yes, yeah, so we're, we're, we're fixing bugs. We're upstreaming them. We've got a, a, a good community. Um, it's very easy to become a member of the Alma Linux community. All you basically have to do is offer a mirror uh, and uh, uh, if you want to, you can join the packaging community and, and, and fix bugs and do bigger things. To do those things, you'll probably be a Fedora community member. Uh, so most of the folks that are making the, uh, the early bug fixes are from Fedora. And uh, I find the community quite fascinating in that regard because there isn't the, the um, polarization that you see in uh, another community that I won't name related to RHEL. Uh, there is there is very much an overlap between the CentOS folks and the the uh, the the RHEL folks and the Fedora folks and the Alma Linux folks, and quite a lot of the people in the Alma Linux community are Fedora committed. So we have a topic in the queue, which is three D printing, and one of us just got a three D printer, another of us has a three D printer, maybe two of us have a three D printer. Maybe three of us do. I do not. Um, so, so Sean. Yeah. To be a, clear, uh, this is, uh, you know, 
I am bringing the levity to the show. This is, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing <laughs> profound. We can And I don't even so. have, yeah, I don't even have the printer yet. It's, it's in raw. Of course, the filaments arrived today, which is about as useful as you can imagine having <laughs> filaments with no <laughs> printer yet uh the but i did want to i was curious if anybody had a 3d printer because i for years i've wanted to have one and i just couldn't justify it and then my wife needs one for work she needs to print out some props for like store displays and stuff and so now i have a rationale Ooh. for ordering it and so i ordered a bamboo printer but the controversy there which i was kind of scolded on on the social media is for, uh, it is, it is not an open platform. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it is not the Prusa. Is that the one that's like super open everything? Uh, it is not that. that. And I was going to get a Prusa printer, but it was like weeks out before it would ship. And, uh, I need it sooner than that. So anyway, I ordered a bamboo printer. They seem to be really good, but they're not open. And, uh, I also went with an FDM printer as opposed to the fancy uh resin printers and so um i'm curious what the thoughts are on resin printers versus you know fdm um and thoughts on am i have i shot myself in the foot over uh, getting a, a non-open printer maybe you could make so, a 3d foot if that happens i could yeah i could <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead jonathan <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I do also have a 3D printer and I've had good success with it. Print off cases for Meshtastic and all kinds of things like that. Nice. Really, really do enjoy being able to do that. Um, in the Meshtastic group, I told the guys what 3D printer I had and I was immediately laughed at. And they said, oh, it's my first 3D printer, which <laughs> is fairly accurate. So I went I went looking. So I said, I, OK, I want to be able to do multi-material, which that that lets you print with two different kinds of material at once. And the fun thing you can do with that is you can print your actual structure and then print supports in a water soluble material, which means that you can then just go take your print right off your print bed, stick it in your sink and, you know, wiggle it around and all of the supports will just fall off. It's, it's the coolest thing. Of course, I don't have it yet. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I, I saw, I, I would love to have a self leveling print bed because manually leveling your print bed is the worst. And it seemed like there was one more thing, you know, decent print size. There's one more thing that I wanted, something like that. And so you go looking for that list of that wish list. And the, the Bamboo X1 is about the only printer that hits all of them. Uh, the yeah, only it problem does. with it and the only reason I don't have one yet is it's, it's not cheap. It's like $1,500. Uh, but as far as I can tell, it's basically the best print, the best uh, uh, FPM printer that's out there right now, if you can afford it. So I, I would not feel bad about your choice at all. All right, cool. And it now, so you're talking about you you have one with multi multiple extruders, so like it can print different materials. I I do not. I oh, want okay. one. I want one okay, very okay. badly because I have okay. broken so many prints trying to peel the supports off. Gotcha. But to yours, clear, I am this, pretty sure does. This is not that. No, this that has an optional add on AMS where it will allow you to switch filaments during the print but it doesn't have the multiple extruders where you can print two different things at the same time. So like you can't do like a support and then a, a thing at the same time. I think the, the Prusa XL is that one that has a multiple, but it's like $3,500. I don't even know. Yeah. If they're, yet. they're expensive to do it. Yeah. Um, mine doesn't do that. Oh, Mine's I, not that cool. I really thought yours was one of them that had it. But you do, no. you do have the uh, auto bed leveling at least. That'll, that'll help yes. you out a lot. Yeah. It has auto bed leveling. It has, so I've never had a printer. So some of the like cool features mean nothing to me. <laughs> so it's like, oh, it has spaghetti <laughs> detection. Like, oh, okay. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have it here. I, so one of the things I do with my printer is I, I print um, like D and D miniatures. And I had a print go to sort of spaghetti, but it actually ended up just melting all of the plastic together. And so I have essentially a, a living blob about yay big that's just melted plastic on top of melted plastic in this weird amorphous blob shape. And it's so the cool, coolest looking monitor or monster, <laughs> but uh, was not what the print was supposed to look like. That's the kind of thing spaghetti detection is. It'll figure okay. that out mid print and stop it. Okay. And so you do D and D characters with an FDM printer then not resin. Cause like that was the whole thing about resin, right? Is like, 
super fine detail, no lines, yes. et cetera, et cetera, but also messy and stinky and you got to wash them and you get resin everywhere and it's toxic and, and stuff. And it seemed like a lot of effort. And I, you probably know me well enough to know that a lot of effort is not my MO. So, <laughs> yeah, resin, resin will get you finer details. It's, it's true because, you know, the way resin works essentially is that you've got, you've got a little projector that is shooting like a 1080p image in UV. And it, so what it does is it cures little tiny bits, a pixel or maybe a voxel at a time of that resin. Well, if you're printing something small and you've got 1080p to work with, you end up with really, really fine resolution. So that is great. And, and so if you're making little miniatures, you can get really, really fine details. The problem, though, there's multiple problems with resin. Um, one is it is a mess and it's a pain to work with. But also you don't get as much structural strength with resin. Whereas, you know, with, with FPM, you can do something like uh, you, can, you can print with some of the filaments that have even like fiber reinforcement built right into them. There's a lot you can do with it. Um, so I, I am, I am pretty satisfied with having a conventional printer as far as that goes. And then if you're really, if you're really into the, the miniature thing, you know, you, you're going to print them and, or you're going to print them and then paint them and the paint's going to cover up all the layer lines. You can put all your details back in with that. That was another question I had. Can you paint over the, the, um, extruded stuff, the plastic? I mean, does paint stick to it? I know there's lots of yeah. different kinds of filament, but. All right, cool. Yeah, and you for do sure. it. I mean, you've done it, so you're the the proof is in the pudding. Is that is that printed? Did you print that and paint it? Yeah, that that is printed and painted. Nice. That's a, that's a character from one of my campaigns from a while ago. All right. Yeah, it, it turned out pretty well too. That that one's actually printed at like three or four x scale, uh, basically as big as I could get it on the printer, and it took something like twenty four hours to print it out, but it turned out great. And you kept the amorphous blob, right? And named it yeah that's somewhere it. around here i i tried <laughs> painting that too i'm i'm very uh sort of a novice when it comes to painting miniatures and the the paint work on that one didn't turn out as well um but yeah i, I worked on painting it too and it it it, it looks fairly looks fairly nice all right so i uh, apparently this is a i mean it's nerdy i guess a little techy <laughs> what kind of what kind of paints do you end up is it like uh, acrylic paints do you have to use like uh stinky paints? i wouldn't I went with acrylic. No, they're not stinky at all. I just, I got the, one of the cheap sets off of Amazon. Um, and so there, there actually, there is an open source angle here. Um, even if your printer is not running open source uh, firmware, most of the things that you print are going to be some iteration, some variation of an open source license. And I, I want to say, I, I'm of the opinion that 3D printing has almost done as much for making things for normal people as open source licensing did for making software for normal people because you can you can go from well you can go from an idea to having something physical very quickly with 3d printing um but you can also share those ideas and those designs and have them printed out so you know you can go to uh, to printables.com and i'm pretty sure there you can tell it i want to sort this by license and only show me you know, permissive open hardware sort of licenses. Mm -hmm. You can find things where people have shared, you know, cases for electronics. Um, I don't have any of my other neat prints right in front of me here, but all kinds of stuff that, you know, you put an open hardware license on it, you share it. And it just, it, it's, it's really become sort of transformative for making those sort of little knickknacks and bits and bobs that you need for all sorts of hardware projects. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it, it becomes a useful thing for me. Like I said, over the years, I haven't had a real rationale for it, but now that my wife needs one, well, I'm going to be able to use it too. Like my first project, I have this, uh, the Ember mug that you see me drinking all the time out of, and you know, it keeps, keeps your coffee at the perfect temperature. And this is the charging coaster. It's got two little pogo pins on it and it's like got a 19 volt power supply. And it just seems like my perfect project. So I'm looking forward to doing that because <laughs> they're like 40 bucks and that seems excessive to buy a, brand name replacement. So anyway, that was my whole topic. Thank you for indulging me with, uh, uh, with making me feel better about my purchase. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, yeah. that was no, a great it, discussion, it, weird guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing you come in, you know, future shows with some of your prints because there, there's this, there's this time period where everything that prints, you're so excited and you'll be like, I, I made Benji look guys. <laughs> I, I, I think you should print a, um, a 3d, 
wig that's green for your head since you're not green anymore. <laughs> I, I get to be green again. You get My daughter's green. getting married this oh, not, really? not this Saturday, oh. but the Saturday after. So and you go green for that after that. So I have to have, I cannot be the focus of attention when I'm walking my daughter down the aisle. It has to oh, be right. Her. Okay. And so, yeah, after that, <laughs> and I, I start a new job on the 16th and I already have permission to have green hair there. So, yeah. Nice. I'm glad you cleared that. I did. <laughs> I, did. <laughs> I know you weren't asking for this employer, but um, my, I'm going to go green. I believe in, in green tech and <laughs> I'm a green head. <laughs> Although it, it, it did run into a complication because it's a uh, video training. So I'm going to be working for CBT Nuggets again. I did years ago. Um, but a lot of the stuff we do is green screen, which oh, the other great. day I'm like, oh, wow, that's going to be interesting. I may it's, have to it, break out the blue screen because like, like part yeah. of your head is missing. Then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be an interesting thing I have to have That'll to do. Handy. Wow. Okay. So. We're going to get to some other questions, uh, but first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitwarden, the only open source cross-platform password manager anywhere, anytime. Security now Steve Gibson has even switched over. With Bitwarden, all of the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. In the summer 2023 G2 Enterprise Grid report, they solidified their position as the highest performing password manager for the enterprise, leaving competitors in the dust. Bitwarden protects your data and privacy by adding strong, randomly generated passwords for each account. Go further with the username generator. Create unique usernames for each account or use any of the five integrated email alias services. Transparently view all of Bitwarden's code available on GitHub. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed yearly, and the results get published on their website. Bitwarden is open source security that you can trust. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 per month per user. Individuals always get Bitwarden's basic free account for unlimited passwords. Upgrade any time to a premium account for less than $1 a month, or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Bitwarden just released a new passwordless SSO feature. SSO with trusted devices lets users log into Bitwarden and decrypt their vault after using SSO on a registered trusted device. No master password needed. This new solution makes it even easier for enterprise users to stay safe and secure with Bitwarden. Learn more about SSO with trusted devices at bitwarden.com slash twit at twit we're fans of password managers get started with bitwarden's free trial of a teams or enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit that's bitwarden.com slash twit so i've got a an, an issue here which is uh relevant to me because I've been looking at maybe getting a new car. I, I have a, uh, a 2005 Subaru Outback, which is basically a box on wheels with all wheel drive is very handy for hauling stuff around. It's actually it's only just turned a hundred thousand miles because it's actually left outside by an old lady for nine years, <laughs> but it does work. And um, we like it. It's not comfortable for long drives though, but here's the cool thing. It's pre spying. It doesn't spy on you. And Mozilla on the 6th of this month came out with a really pretty comprehensive report called Privacy Nightmare on Wheels. Every car brand reviewed by, Mo by Mo every car brand reviewed by Mozilla, including Ford, Volkswagen, and Toyota, flunks privacy tests. It's a very long headline. And you can go in and look at all the different kinds of cars and what their privacy policies are. You can't get, they can't get into them very well because these are not open source at all. 
They are closed source. They're, they're buried behind the dashboard. One interesting one for me is Tesla, because one would think, hey, Tesla, boy, they can spy on you so many ways. I think it's electric, does all these things. But the Tesla is basically a computer that's also a car. And you're looking, I mean, it's not perfect open source wise, but they sound at least a little bit more committed to privacy than the others are, even though they can narc, uh, you know, spy on you all kinds of ways. It's a pretty depressing report because in the, you know, in the computing world with, with phones and computers and mobile devices and, and, you know, little portable things you can get and carry around and anything that computes, we could generally look at to some degree, but your car is, is opaque. This stuff's going on behind the dashboard. Your car comes with, for example, a, uh, a, um, uh, a cell phone in it, but you never see it, but it's a cell phone number. Your car has a cell phone number, just like it has a vehicle identification number and it's narking on you. Um, some of this, you know, we're already familiar with, with our mobile devices, for example, because that's what tells Google and Bing and Apple that there's traffic because your phone is telling those uh, out, uh, outfits through the phone company that you are a traffic sensing device. And, uh, and we never get that information. But they do. It's an issue. It's a separate issue. But cars are bad, <laughs> privacy-wise. And I don't know how we approach these. I don't know. And and I'm I'm curious to know also. Maybe Simon knows something about this. Whether or not it's as bad in Europe. Um, uh, Volkswagen and BMW are among the offenders here. They sell in the U.S. Obviously. So I don't know. You guys have any thoughts about this? I was encouraged by the. I'm no longer encouraged, but um, I was I was encouraged with the notion <laughs> of things like um, uh, Apple's CarPlay and Android Auto, where the the smarts were going to be in your phone. And I still I, I I'm an Apple phone user. My family is. So that's what, what I have. And uh, I like that the smarts are there, but uh, I, I'm disheartened because, like, for example, Chevrolet is not going to be having though like android auto or apple carplay in their ev line they're going to be using their own software which means you have no access at all i mean you have no control over what what is happening there i don't even know what it's going to look like i think it was a terrible idea i love the lower third thank you yeah uh i did notice my lower third now i appreciate that um (laughs) anyway (laughs) um so i don't don't know and even our car you know right now when i use something like um CarPlay, yeah, my my car still has a 4G modem that's connected. Even though I don't subscribe to the service, it's still connecting to towers. I, I don't know what, what kind of data is going to and from my car to anyone. I just have no idea. So I, I was hoping that automakers would get out of the, uh, we, are, we are the smart software people because they suck so bad at making decent software in their head-end units, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So yeah i don't have a good answer other than drive a really old car i was just thinking that my 97 ford ranger and my 05 nissan quest seemed really really good and really worth keeping on the road now <laughs> yeah my classic beetles yeah, are awesome um, for a different reason now right <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm holding on to this uh this old subaru for the same reason so S- simon i mean you, you must have some thoughts about this <laughs> well uh, you know i'm i'm hugely discouraged by uh, the whole motor industry, um, uh, you know, forgetting all the stuff about, you know, gasoline or petrol. Um, if you look at the vehicles they're producing now, they come with the invasion of your privacy built in uh, by default. Uh, and they come with software that is intended to monetize you and turn the car into, uh, you know, vehicle as a service. Uh, so I was particularly discouraged, for example, by BMW, who now sell um, access to the heated seats that are in your BMW already, but oh. they now cost you $18 a month to, to activate. Uh, or you can, at the moment, pay them $415 for unlimited access, but we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, and this, this trend is continuing through all the features that they're putting in. Uh, you know, the, the premium access to the locations of traffic cameras and to... Uh, the the uh, access to reporting on accidents and uh, different kinds of routing is is going to be restricted. 
uh, access to features and the vehicle is going to be restricted. And then that's on top of what you just described, which is they are uh, involved in the surveillance society, instrumenting the vehicle and selling information about you to absolutely everyone they can. Uh, and I'm especially discouraged by the fact that the laws in Europe that are meant to deal with that in the rest of society, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, have basically got big carve-outs for the motor industry in them. So I think we're in a terrible place here at the moment with motor vehicles, because if you want to get an electric vehicle, you are going to have to have one that is permanently connected. There are, as far as I know, no electric vehicles on the market that are not permanently connected to the company that sold them to you. And so my lifelong instinct, which is that I never want to have a relationship with a motor vehicle manufacturer, and I want the transaction to be one that concludes as I leave the showroom, and I never want to hear from them ever again, if I possibly can. Uh, That is now impossible with electric vehicles, because you have to have an ongoing relationship, and they're making it impossible with um, with, uh, uh, fossil fuel powered vehicles as well, because you're going to need to have a relationship in order to have the steering wheel have a a full 180 turn and to have the heated seats turn on and for the headlights to work at night and and for all of those sorts (laughs) of things. You know, those are all going to be premium extras. Oh, um, uh, Doc, you want to drive at night? Oh, well, that's that's in our uh, deluxe (laughs) night driver package. Uh, Oh, you want to drive in the rain, do you? Oh, well, I'm afraid the windscreen wipers are extra. (laughs) Um, that's, you, you, you it's, had back seats, you had locks, so you have to rent those. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's that, ex- exactly like flying Ryanair, but it's in your own car. Yeah, so, so I, I, I see this two ways. Neither one of them is good, but I think it's part of the same thing. One is the digitization of everything. And, at a cert- and there's this law, almost an iron law in tech, that what can be done will be done. Um, and we take it to an extreme and then back off uh, one way or another. It applied to nuclear power. It applies to hammers. It applies to everything. And and it applies here. It's like what can be done will be done. Um, a guy named T. Rob Wyatt, who is in one of the communities that I'm involved with, back in 2012, had a very eloquent blog post about this. And he came to meetings just shouting to the rooftops about how this is starting to happen, that the automobile industry is completely in the thrall of, of, of jealousy over the online advertising industry saying, we want to be able to do this in cars. We're looking at this as a profit center. We want to just digitize everything. But I think it's, so that's one thing that's going on. But the other thing is as cars become more electrical, they become more uh, electronic. And as we drift toward, toward getting all, you know, toward um, electric cars, becoming and first with hybrids and now with electric cars becoming the norm. Um, it's like we as drivers become, to use a new verb here, backseated more and more and more. We're not the drivers. We are driven and we're driven by, you know, the, the, these things are our chauffeurs and they're narking on us all the time because they can. And the hard thing for me is where I, I this, I am not, uh, you know, I, I have this libertarian streak that says every new law protects yesterday from last, th- last Thursday and less of this for another 150 years or something. And I worry about new laws respecting this, but I think we law may be the only way we could do this. We may only need, we may need regulation that says, no, no, no. And all the data you're gathering about people, it goes to them first. They get to valve it on or off, whether or not it's, it's shared. And uh, maybe you could leave a back door in for law enforcement, but I don't like that either. But um I don't know. Jonathan, you have any thoughts about this? I think you're sort of somewhat of a similar mind on this kind of thing. Yeah. So not. I will, I will tell you the thing that really first comes to mind for me is that in the United States and other places around the world, there's, there's quite a culture of doing car modifications. Yeah. You know, bolting Take on that parts crap to get out. more power. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing that comes to mind. What on a lot of these new cars, is there somebody selling a replacement uh, nav and entertainment center? Or alternatively, can you jailbreak your nav and entertainment center on such and such new car, or replace it with something open source, or you know at least go too. in and it, flip the switches? I bet it voids the warranty. I bet you know if you do something like that, nothing is your is warrantied then in your car anymore. It would be my guess. You know, like what if you unplugged the plug to make your and plugged you know, uh, you just shorted the thing so your seats heated up. 
and the computer detected that it was unplugged or something. I mean, I could picture like, oh, no, sorry, your warranty's voided. Oh, your transaxle went out right after you did that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the thing that I fear is and I, I get that and that's that's something to worry about. But the thing that I fear even more is uh, car manufacturers using the DMCA to say, oh, no, no, you can't sell a, a piece of software that turns off our uh, our tracking and advertising because you had to circumvent our DRM to be able to do it. And yeah. here you have to take that down. Ugh. So, OK, so, so your answer, Jonathan, is. Let's just get a culture to jailbreak these things and make them ours as much yeah. as possible. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Warranties, warranties be damned. Um, so, S Simon, you're, you're sharing with us on our back channel, uh, classicelectriccars.co.uk. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, they, it looks they, cool. They, anyway. they, these people will let you turn your uh, your car into an EV. Um, they, they do a, a really excellent job. I've seen some of these. Uh, you'll notice that most of these vehicles are small and cute that they're doing it with. And, and that's great as well, because I've discovered it's really hard to buy a small EV. Uh, most EVs are the size of American cars. Um, so, yeah, I, I like the look of these people. I don't think they're the answer, though. Uh, I, I also mm -hmm. tend to believe that the only answer is for us to uh, have uh, the surveillance society become illegal. And I think that that is probably the fix. Uh, you know, I, I don't dislike uh, advertisements. I, I find advertisements quite colorful on my web pages. The reason I have uh, a copy of Pie Hole installed on my home network is not to get rid of the advertisements. It's to get rid of all of the intrusive surveillance and collection of uh, information about me by the advertising companies that I have Pie Hole installed. And I, and I think that's the stuff that we need to see more legislation about. And uh, there's legislation in California about it. There's a bunch of legislation in Europe about it. But we have to get more serious and tell the advertising industry. And my apologies to Twit TV, who, who, who make all their money from advertisers. But nonetheless, uh, I, I think we need to tell the advertising industry that it is not OK to m mass collect information about us, triangulate on us with it, sell it to political campaigns to target us, uh, sell it to medical companies to target us. That's all disgusting behavior. And I think that we need to tell our representatives in, in our um, parliaments and in Congress that we believe it's disgusting and get it made illegal. And pro it button in here, uh, Mr. Phipps. No, no need for that apology because here at Twit, we are strongly against advertiser tracking. You know, we discussed that quite heavily here on the network each and every day. Yes, we have host red ads. You're not going to get all of this crazy tracking analytics from us. Plus, there's other ways that we try to monetize, which oh, I'm sure we'll get into at the end of the show. OK, back to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, um, I, I, so you mentioned pie hole. That's pie dash yeah. hole dot net. So tell us a little bit about that. Then we'll take a break. Okay. Pie hole is a, um, it's a, uh, a, a DNS that is connected to dev null so that every time any device on your home network requests the, uh, the resolution of a domain name, uh, that is known to be part of an advertising surveillance activity, uh, what gets returned is something harmless. And it results in uh, all of the apps that you're running uh, in your home, on your PCs and on your, uh, your smart TV, uh, on your phones, all the time you're on your home network, you don't get any advertisements because you're not being tracked. And so uh, I have that installed on a Raspberry Pi in the rack downstairs in and it's uh, covering all of my devices. Um, let me just look at the display here today. Uh, it has blocked 567 advertisements for me today uh, on my um, devices at home. So I very much recommend people looking at that. It's all open source. It all runs on any computer you like. It doesn't have to be on a Raspberry Pi. And uh, it is very straightforward what it's doing. It's, it's being a proxy DNS so that all of the mechanics of the surveillance system are being intercepted and neutralized. I think it's you know, it might be sad. Is a pie hole it, is brought it, to you by Floss Weekly. But go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it might be worth noting real quick that blocking ads is actually becoming a security recommendation too. And uh, somebody, I forget who, but somebody pointed out that. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, the FBI, among other people. But somebody pointed out that, you know, this wasn't a thing until the advertisers, you know, in on multiple websites kept having worse and worse behavior and not cleaning it up. And it's gotten to the point to now where you just and I start doing this for customers, too. You pretty much have to block ads to be able to keep them from accidentally clicking on something that, you know, it'll redirect them to a website, which goes to another website. And suddenly you've got you've got malware on your machine. So we're getting close to the end of the show. So let's take a quick break and we'll be back with the finals right after that. So any, any final thoughts, any one of the three of you want to jump in with uh, something to help us? I mean, I'll just say, you know, Simon mentioned that, that place that will do cars and convert old cars to EVs. Um, EV West here in the States sells DIY kits, which I have, I want so bad, Um, but they're like just under 20 grand which is about 20 grand more than I had to spend on such a thing. Uh, yes. But it comes with like the mode. It's like a complete kit to switch a classic beetle to full EV and uh, includes like motor and a battery packs and all the wiring. And you don't have to do, it just bolts on where the engine would bolt onto your transmission. So your transmission and clutch and everything is the same. Uh, so, oh yeah, I want it so bad. I just can't even explain how bad I want it. <laughs> And that was the only, I had I nothing act- useful to add other than that would be so cool. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I did make my bike an EV. I, I bought a, a kit for it and uh, made my pedal bike into an EV and it's a lot cheaper than that. Yeah, I, I believe that's the case. Yeah. And I have a, I already have an EV bike, a little less fun in the winter. To- <laughs> <laughs> and that all depends from where you live here in Oklahoma. It'd be fine in the winter, but trying to, ride your bike out when it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit is just not something <laughs> I want to do. That's a, that's a pure throttle, no pedal day. If it, it's yes, still yes. too hot for that. You want to, you can only, you should only go fast. There should be no slow on that. <laughs> it, kind of tricky up in Minnesota in the winter as well. There you go. Probably. Um, and, and you pointed out, I think Simon in our own back channel here, that John Deere, which is famously, locked up their stuff uh is now allowing farmers to fix their own tractors which uh yeah i, I think they saw they the writing the on the wall no i think they saw yeah. the, I, the, there there was a lot of outcry about it and i think they saw legislators beginning to pay attention to the fact that this was not okay and i think that they've made that concession so that it doesn't become a legal requirement i think that's what's going on there but i, I think there is Legislators have caught wind of the fact that uh, the uh, fix it yourself movement is a very real, very realistic, and very necessary. And I think we we will see legislation put in place if vendors try to bolt everything to the floor. Uh, that's why I think we're going to see modular uh, modular Apple phones in Europe at some point soon, is because oh, they really? understand that. Yeah, I think we're going to see re- well, we're going to see replaceable batteries certainly. Because uh, I think they're about to become a legal requirement, and I think they're getting out ahead of that. Yeah, good I mean, Corey Doctor, we, we, a, go ahead. We Simon, finally right? have USB C. I was just Yay! saying, yeah. So they finally, they if, only have USB-C and oh. if only it works. If only it works. There's a uh, um, uh, Corey Doctor had a piece about it. I don't I, about how Apple did make their make changing your own battery available, where you you ordered something and a thing came in a suitcase and then you did a whole bunch of stuff in a suitcase or you could go down to the fix a shop on the corner and they could do it in, in 10 minutes <laughs> with their own tools you know <laughs> anyway because they've been doing this for years anyhow so it's a yeah i think my wife i think has an iphone 6 um and uh and i think she's had the battery replaced two or three times on that always by that the after, in the aftermarket I thought, world I, I didn't I mean, I thought the three G towers were shut down. So I, if if she has an iPhone six, that's no. Impressive. It does. It does four G. The oh, S six okay. is four G. Um, yeah, yeah Wi Fi call it. Three G. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it still works. It still works. Cool. I, I should note as we're pretty close to the end here. This is a. Um, we have, we went to T Mobile here in the U S. Owned by a German company, by the way, also called T Mobile. Um, that. Uh, uh, we got the international plan, which had unlimited data. And uh, it was a 2G, then 3G when 4G came along. It tended to be slower, but often it popped up to 4G because it's harder for the carriers to disable the 4G to get it down to 3G because nobody wants to use it anymore. 
anyway, or the towers may not be built for it. And they're not just towers, by the way. In Europe, they do a good job of disguising them as church steeples and flagpoles and road signage and other stuff like that. But anyway, um, she just went to Italy while I went to Boston for an obligation. And, and our unlimited plan turned out not to be unlimited. It gave you five gigabytes and then you had to pay more. And they said, no, that's part of the unlimited plan now. <laughs> and, and apparently I'm told from doing a little bit of research, there's still the best of the breed here in the U S but it's gotten worse going outside the country. It's kind of moved back into the past. Unlimited data is not as easy to get. And that's, really sad and unfortunate because it feels like we're going back into the past here. Simon, do you have any thoughts about that, uh, that the tariffs going back up or the countries aren't getting along or the, all the different carriers are just trying to bring back the charge for everything you can any way you can? They'll charge for everything they can at any moment. And you can tell that because um, my I'm not allowed to talk about partisan politics here, but it's not partisan to say that I hate Brexit. And uh, one of the things that happened as a result of Brexit is roaming charges came back for U UK citizens going into Europe, which the phone companies had said would not happen. But as soon as they saw that lovely money just sitting on the table, they immediately went for it. And the golden rule is that if there is money left on the table, the phone companies will go for it because uh, they're reptiles. You know, there's there's no other way to think about it. <laughs> and, we're not, uh, we're allowed know. to say they're reptiles. As J.P. <laughs> Ragaswamy, who we may want to get on this at some point. <laughs> J.P. <laughs> they're dinosaurs, but they're still alive. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh I worked for him at BT in, in the UK and my favorite line from him was saying at BT as their chief scientist, our core competency is not communications. It's billing. <laughs> and so there, there you go. Anyhow, it's a very okay, hard problem down. billing, you know, yeah, yeah. it's hard. They've got it. They've solved that problem. Um, okay. So let's uh, go around the square table. <laughs> I'm hearing sound effects there. And uh, any to, to get to our plugs. Oh, I'll go first. I got really nothing other than uh, the weird guy, uh, lower third that has my newsletter. You know, I'm switching, uh, switching jobs, which I don't know what that means as far as like online activities go. But uh, my newsletter there, the first link, you'll always get information about me from me and about other stuff, too. So, you know. So All right. Jonathan, uh, you got yeah, I'll jump in next. And, so yeah. I will I will plug Hackaday. We've got an article upcoming, working on it late into the night last night about the Meshastic radios, the part two of three of fun things yeah. you can do with that and open source. Uh, and then don't forget the Untitled Linux show. We had quite the milestone this past week. The 20,000th podcast on the Twit Network was our latest ULS episode. And so uh, I, I think we might uh, we might uh, wow. we might whisper into somebody's ear and ask that one to get released publicly for everybody to be able to enjoy. I think that would be fun. Uh, but that is for most of the episodes a Club Twit exclusive. And goodness, <laughs> if you're not on Club Twit yet, why not? It's about the cost of a cup of coffee per month. Get on Club Twit. <laughs> Great plug. Great plug. So Simon, you've got something. Yeah. So um, there is my favorite conference coming up in Europe. Uh, if uh, you're looking for a conference to go to, you want to meet a, an amazingly welcoming and warm group of people in a fantastic location for a short but beautiful conference. It's called the South Tyrol Free Software Conference. It happens in a city you've never heard of called Bolzano in Italy. And um, uh, it is happening at the start of November. And uh, that's the it's the the other link. Uh, and uh, and um, SFSCon is a conference that you've probably never heard of, but you'll see that the agenda is uh, fantastically varied. Uh, the presenters are people who are not at every other conference that you've ever been to. I, it's a free conference. There's no fee to attend it. I absolutely recommend that you go along to SFSCon or if you can't make it to SFSCon, to uh, that you watch the live stream of the sessions, which will all be very good. And then at the start of December, I'll be at that other conference at the Open Source Experience in Paris, that 6th and 7th of December. Um, we'll be having the last birthday party of the year for the 25th anniversary of uh, Open Source. 
So uh, come along to that and have a slice of cake with me. And I think that that's my plugs. Oh, and follow me on Mastodon, please. Webmink. The one and only Webmink. Um, I, I have a couple small ones. One is that I will be actually at uh, the Computer History Museum um, on <laughs> week after next. I'll be I'll be a display in the computer history. <laughs> I was thinking it. I was that's thinking it. I admit it. When I die, that's what I should be like, like, uh, like Jeremy Bentham. You know, like <laughs> yeah, in a case, in a wooden case, you know, in a case. But my head will be somewhere else because it's you know they put a coconut there instead. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so, so, but um, I'll be at the Internet Identity Workshop, which I co-organize, um, and that is the week after next. It is a, a fantastic uh, conference. It's n no no panels, no uh, speakers of any kind. We just it's all breakouts and all working on stuff, and it's fairly cheap as those things go. And the day before that, there's going to be something called the VRM VRM Day, and uh, look that up or look at my look at my blog. You'll find it there. Anyway, but the other thing is, on my way up there, I'm going to stop. And I'm only mentioning this because of the cars, not for the wine, but Little Uvis Vineyards um, is uh, uh, the Love Vineyards. Uh, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law run that place. It's off of 101 uh, South of Morgan Hill at the Madsen exit. Anyway, they have the most amazing collection of old cars, uh, classic cars there. And I'm sure none of them spy on you. So I wanted to let you know about that because it's not just good wine and pizza and other stuff like that, but they have these amazing cars. So always fun. Anyhow, so that's, that's about it. Um, next week, I have to bring up the thing again, cause I'm never prepared. I was prepared last week for something that didn't happen. <laughs> so, so for this week, <laughs> next, next week, got it. Okay. Cooper Quinton of, um, of the EFF. We've been talking EFF stuff this week. He'll be back. He'll be there next week. Uh, Catherine's going to co-host. So show up for that. It's always going to be good. And we'll see you then. It's midweek and you really want to know even more about the world of technology. So you should check out Tech News Weekly, the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. It's the biggest news. We talk with the uh, people writing the stories that you're probably reading. We also talk between ourselves about the stories that are getting us even more excited about tech news this week. So if you're excited, well, then join us. Head to twit.tv slash TNW to subscribe. <laughs>